guys, it's Risa Furrow back again with yet another OVO book reading. Now, after I get done with this video, I'll be trying to edit my second before going back to Minecraft. But, we might be going into the finale with it, so I'm kind of very excited with it. Well, the finale of the book. Book 1. It has been a very, very adventurous ride. And we'll see how much that we can get done today. So, let's get right into it. Eleven Eva Skinner, California, United States of America, January 9th, it felt good. It felt alive. And even if it had lost much precious time to find the right person, the result was worth all the trouble. Not that little boy in Massachusetts. Not even the young man on the private jet. Eva. Through her he would shape his destiny. Through her, his chosen. The security guard was two meters tall and just as large, with a dark t-shirt pulled on over the muscles of a bodybuilder. He shot a dark glare into the girl's eyes. Then, he noticed her fan club badge and gestured for them to pass him. This way he said in a surly tone. Eva Skinner advanced through the metal barricades followed. By Susie, Jennifer, and five other girls from the club's guiding committee. They had avoided the earlier chaos as the crowd assembled. To their right hand side the pupils of Meredith Logan were pressing up against the barriers. To the left there was the stage separated from the public by only a low wall and a short piece of lawn. The band's percussion section took up almost half of the available space, with five bass drums and an unspecified number of snare drums, cymbals, tom-toms, and kettle drums. There were bongos and tribal drums for the slower songs, and a long rack on which the multitude of guitars Freno would need during the concert were stored. Bumba's keyboards, mounted on spring-loaded stands that allowed him to move to the rhythm of the music, were positioned next to the special effects computers. And finally there was Gardenia's microphone and Mystic's bass guitar, resting on an easel in the center of the stage. Incredible Susie murmured, her eyes wide open. Insane Jennifer mimicked the sentiment. Eva however, did not say anything. She was watching the stage technicians who were about to connect the last of the cables. The huge plasma screen TVs were playing a looping video of the highlights of the band's world tour. The girls were in a fantastic position, they would be the first ones to see Gardenia when she came on stage. Enjoy life and long live rock and roll, she would yell. And then, we are the subdigitals. Suddenly, all the stage lights illuminated and the students crowding against the barriers began to chant, Subdig. 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 Their disappointment was huge when they realized that the person advancing between all the instruments on stage was not Gardenia, but Professor Hannah Jeffrey Logan, the school's principal and great-great-great-granddaughter to Murdyth, its titular founder. There followed a long silence, before Logan began her attack, this event that you are all so enthusiastic for, is in fact an educational moment of great importance for our school. Music is fundamental in the shaping of young minds, and this concert will resound across the nation, after five minutes of this incessant droning the students could not take any more. The chant started up again with more strength than beforehand, punctuated this time with isolated cries of, enough already. We want Gardenia. Gardenia's name began to run from one mouth to the next, building into a deafening roar. Eventually the headmistress raised her hands and concluded, as I'm sure you understand. Go in peace, and now, without further delay, I would like to present the famous subnominals, CEB Digitals, screamed back the gathered crowd, with enough force to mess up her hair. Yes, of course, as you were. Good afternoon. She made a quick about turn and on stage the lights went out. Here it comes a trembling Eva whispered. They're starting. The sound of Mystic's bass began to spread in the air, punching out the same note repeatedly, and the crowd's enthusiasm went through the roof. The security gorillas had to press against the barriers with all their weight to prevent them from collapsing. Then Freno began his guitar solo. The stage was still empty. Then a woman's voice, clear as crystal, addressed the public, enjoy life, and long live rock and roll, 
the audience responded in chorus. That's right. It was almost a whisper, but it emanated a mad energy, as if trying and failing to suppress itself. Today, at Meredith Logan High School of Berkeley, California. The voice had risen for a moment, but then suddenly returned to a whisper, we hadn't planned on your graceful headmistress being the opening act, but didn't she warm you up for us? Luckily for us though, we no longer have to go to school. Cries, laughter. We are here for you. We are here to entertain you. We are, the CEB Digitals. The lights blazed on and the musicians came running on stage. Then there was an explosion of music, motion, voices, and Eva did not understand anything anymore, except that she was perfectly happy. An hour and twenty minutes into the concert, she had screamed to the point of losing her voice. When Freno launched into a loud guitar solo, the adrenaline had clenched her throat shut so violently that she thought she was about to faint. Ladies and gentlemen, announced Gardenia from the stage. We're proud to now perform for you our latest single. It's called, The Public Finished It For Her, Love Love Punka. The guitar's intensity increased, the other instruments joining in, and behind the stage the darkened widescreens suddenly lit up, playing the song's music video. A little boy was waking up in a disorderly bedroom, was eating breakfast. Life is sometimes weird, hey, boring, hey, slow, hey, but that's my call cause I love love pun ka. Gardenia was dressed in the uniform of a cleaning lady. She was walking along a street, saw the little boy making his escape and took his hand. In a rainy back alley Freno was playing his guitar while laid out in the gap between two rubbish skips, then the camera zoomed up onto the staircase of one building's fire escape, where Bumba was playing his keyboards. I know I wanna say that I love love punka. Gardenia was now picking up a rose and imbuing it with new life, the stalk lengthening down to the ground and taking root, growing into a robust plant that lifted Gardenia and the little boy up into the sky. The flower's corolla was opening in a whirl of colors. Then, for an instant, the petals transformed. They became two concentric circles, forming an eye. Something that Eva had seen before. It happened so quickly that no one else in the crowd took any notice of it. But the image was implanted in Eva Skinner's brain. And around her, everything became black. 12 The Mystery of the Builders, City of the Iron Tower, France, January 9. The game of hide and seek had been quickly wrecked. Odd had only just started looking for the others when Jeremy and Elida had reappeared through the trapdoor in the attic and asked him to stop. Then the three of them had gone searching for Ulrich and Yumi, quickly finding them in the living room, sitting in silence on the couch. Something must have happened, because the girl seemed furious and Ulrich was regarding her timorously, like an inexperienced animal handler facing off against an undomesticated tiger. Elida has an idea, Jeremy announced to them. In the cellar there are some sacks of cement marked with the address of a construction firm in the city. So what? asked Ulrich. We were thinking of going to the address on the sacks and seeing if anyone there ever worked on the hermitage. On a Sunday. Yumi intervened. This is the only day when we're free to do what we want. School starts up again tomorrow after all. Do you know how many years those sacks may have been moldering down there Einstein? I'm guessing at least 10. It was only a suggestion. Bullrick was wiping snow from his hair with a towel. Is it really that important? Jeremy told me about the secret passages, Elida explained. Perhaps if we talked to the people who helped build them we could learn something we don't already know. Maybe one of them knew my father, they stared at her in silence. It was Yumi who eventually said what everyone was thinking, getting to the bottom of this isn't going to do us any harm. But it doesn't make sense for all of us to just get up and go together, objected Odd. Someone has to stay here and prepare snacks for later. I don't believe this, you can't always be hungry, exclaimed Jeremy. Odd's right. There's no need for all of us to go. For example, I'd be better off staying here to clear the house with, Yumi indicated towards Ulrich with her head. Get this mud off my legs. Ulrich hissed in the silence that followed. Or I'm going to smother it with the towel. It was snowing again. Icy needles were settling lightly on the clothes of passers-by, turning them into irregular white figures. Odd sneezed. I don't understand why this fell to you and me in the end. Jeremy smiled. No, you probably wouldn't. But consider this, Bulric and Yumi evidently need to make peace with one another, but they would never have agreed to stay alone in the hermitage together. Hence Elida had to stay behind with them. But I could have stayed behind instead. I would have had them signing an armistice in a nanosecond. 
More likely you would convince them to skip the niceties of diplomacy and have them jump straight into kung fu negotiations. Jeremy concluded, sniggering. He wasn't sure what exactly had transpired between the two of them, but he was certain that at some point William Dunbar had entered the picture. The majority of Yumi and Ulrich's arguments revolved around him in some form or another. The grey sky grew darker still, until it was as black as the surface of the road they followed through the buildings and streets of the city. Exactly what are we looking for? Odd asked after a while. 117 Rue de Tivoli, Jeremy reminded him. It's the address of a firm of contractors called Brillette and Brothers. If they really did some work on the Hermitage, and assuming someone there still remembers Hopper, they might be able to provide us with some information. How much time has passed since when they probably worked on the house? At least 11 years. Possibly more. Uh -huh, commented Odd. It seems to me that we're out here catching pneumonia for nothing. The two boys crossed the place de la Revolution, an open square of dark paving tiles surrounded by small shops bedecked with Christmas lights. They cut down Rue de Provence and passed several people wrapped up in waterproof jackets, waiting for a bus that would never come. Rue de Tivoli should be the second or third road on the left. It was an anonymous street of offices. As they proceeded down it, the smart buildings gave way to poorer buildings in dire need of repair, alternating with said warehouses. Hey, this is only number two. Odd had said, indicating the address of the first of the grand civic buildings. Great, another lovely long walk lies ahead of us. It felt like trekking up to Calvary, the wind smacking at their cheeks and whirling more and more snowflakes into their eyes. The sidewalks were treacherous frozen panes of glass and so instead the boys trudged up the middle of the road, where snow plows had sowed salt and transformed the snow-covered asphalt into a dense and muddy slush. Their destination was an old and shabby building, perhaps the most run-down on the entire street. The front, which in better days had probably been a beautiful olive green, was now almost grey and the snow stuck to the surface as if it was flypaper. The door was a simple brass frame supporting two dark and filthy glass doors. The intercom beside it had 12 buttons, and none of them was marked with a name. All right Einstein, said Odd. It's a dead end. No one's lived here for at least a century. We should try some of the buttons at random. Or do you want to start straight back? They looked down the long street back to Rue de Provence and sighed. Then they mashed all the buttons simultaneously and stood waiting. Goodness knows if this still works, Jeremy grumbled, stabbing randomly at some of the buttons again. Then. From behind the glass doors a thin voice could be heard, I'm coming. I'm coming. Always rushing about. Today is a holiday, you know. A key turned in the lock and the door shook, but still didn't open. Then Odd seized one of the door handles, yanked it. Towards himself and found himself holding an impressively elderly lady between his arms. She was very short and very frail, like a little girl. The skin on her face, stretched tight over the cheeks, was almost transparent and her little eyes looked tired but kind. Oh, my, the old lady exclaimed, docilely liberating herself from Odd's embrace. You really are quite hasty, young man. Excuse me madam, replied Jeremy, somewhat embarrassed. We're looking for someone from the firm of Brillette and Brothers. Is this the correct address? The old lady smiled. Aren't you a little young to be in the builder's trade? In any case, yes, you have the correct address. You better come inside. It's too cold to be doing much talking outside. But is Mr. Brillet here? She did not answer, limiting herself to inviting them inside. I've just made tea. Jeremy and Odd shared a fleeting glance. A cup of tea didn't seem like such a bad idea right now. The lady, Marie Lemoyne, lived in an apartment on the ground floor of the building, with several items of furniture that had seen better days, a prehistoric black and white television, and a radio the size of a sideboard that was crackling out music from the last century. The tea was faded in worn ceramic cups, along with a plate, full of biscuits of a decidedly dubious appearance. Odd inserted one in his mouth and Jeremy saw his eyes bulge as he forced himself to chew. He decided not to try them. Perhaps they aren't as fresh as they used to be, admitted the old lady. It's not often that I have guests, you see. Jeremy decided that the time had come to explain the purpose of their visit. As I indicated beforehand, Ms. Lemoyne, we are looking for Mr. Brillet. Of the firm Brillet and Brothers, appended the woman. Now they haven't worked out of here for quite some time. Do you remember anything about them? Marie gave Jeremy a severe glare. For your information young man, 
I have been the superintendent in this building for almost 20 years, and I have a photographic memory. If you thought I'd forget Philippi, Jean Jacques, and Jean Pierre Brulette, then you're much mistaken. They had an office here on the first floor for 10 years, until. Care for another biscuit. With surprising agility, the old lady picked one of them up off the plate and threw it straight into Odd's mouth, who quickly turned purple and started coughing violently. Marie Lemoyne continued, as I was saying, they were here for 10 years before Jean-Pierre and Jean-Jacques died. An unfortunate work accident. Corinne, the girl who helped them with the accounting, told me that the two brothers were working on a scaffold. They didn't have many workers, it was a small firm, and the sad truth is that the scaffold collapsed. Philippi was the youngest brother, the kind of person who was always cheerful. But in just six months he had sold the firm and rented the offices out to Mr. Gaston. Now there was a gentleman, if I don't say so myself, there was this one occasion, and Philippi? What happened to him? Jeremy cut in. Marie seemed somewhat annoyed by the interruption. He moved to a city in the south. He said he couldn't bring himself to stay here anymore. When did all this happen, what year? Marie sipped calmly at her tea, enjoying being the subject of their total attention. It seemed she was taking her time so as not to ruin the suspense. You two little boys are very strange. You come here, on a Sunday afternoon, to interrogate me about things that happened over a decade ago. In any case, it's been, let me see, when was it that Philippi moved away? She suddenly turned to Odd. You are quite the smiley type, and quite a gourmet. Are you sure you wouldn't care for another biscuit? Odd remained immobile with his lips sealed, fearful of finding another one lodged in the bottom of his throat. Jeremy decided to intervene in the interest of protecting his friend. Ms. Lemoyne he said in the most well-mannered tone he could manage. I apologize for asking this of you, but did. Philippi leave any means by which you could contact him? I don't know, maybe a telephone number. Of course. He left his new address and telephone number, so that we could arrange for his payments to be suspended, along with various other matters. Closing a business is a complicated affair you know. There's a mountain of bureaucracy to overcome. Suppliers to settle with, contracts that need to be ended, and do you still have that address? Why are you interested? Jeremy bit his lip, trying to think of a quick excuse which at the same time would sound convincing. My friend he said, indicating towards Odd, is Mr. Brulette's grandson, and he's never met his grandfather. At those words, the old lady rose from her chair and planted a rough kiss on each of Odd's cheeks. Philippi's grandson. I never knew he had a son or a daughter, but yes, I can see the resemblance. You have his eyes. And how come you have never met your darling grandfather, young man? Jeremy kept improvising. Er, well, it's a very sad story. Philippe's daughter, the mother of my friend, had to move to Paris and unfortunately has lost her memory. But she's told us so much about everything that, she told you? How can she if she's lost her memory? Jeremy had become entangled in his own story and it was up to Odd to try and cut him free. Might I have another cup of tea miss? He asked innocently. Thank you for being so. Kind he added quickly. You know, this has always been my dream. To reunite the family I mean, Marie Lemoyne's expression melted into a smile and she seemed to cast aside any uncertainties. Of course, of course. You poor young thing. I'll go looking for your grandfather's address. I've got an archive of all the old building tenants in the living room, it'll be somewhere in there. The old lady shuffled into another room and returned several minutes later, a crumpled slip of paper in her hand. Here it is. He doesn't live in the city anymore, but you can find him here, she pressed the scrap of paper into Odd's hands. When they were back outside, surrounded once more by the snow, Jeremy looked amusedly at Odd. Tell me the truth. Were those biscuits really that horrible? You have no idea. Jeremy laughed heartily. 13 Eva Skinner, California, United States of America, January 9th, are you all right? A woman's voice asked kindly. You've opened your eyes. You gave us quite a scare, a girl joined in. Eva Skinner was in the school infirmary, and floating in front of her were the concerned faces of Dr. Yuan and her friend Susie. Eva opened her mouth, but was unable to speak. Something within her was manipulating her like a marionette. Something that had taken control of her mind. XANA was now giving the orders, one at a time. To open the mouth. To articulate the language. To speak. It was all very complicated. Dr. Yuan smiled. 
You fell ill suddenly at the concert, she said gently. Ill, thought Xana. He had never felt so good. He felt great. All he had to do was acclimatize to this new body. And recover from the long and laborious journey he had begun as a digital fragment hiding at the bottom of the sea, he had become an internet virus, a video message relayed through a phone, and finally the music video at the concert. All to find the right person. Eva Skinner. Thankfully you don't seem to be badly hurt. Your parents will be here shortly to take you home. Eva tried to speak again, and again she failed. It was a terrible effort. Let's leave her for now, the doctor told Susie. She needs to rest. The girl looked reproachfully at Eva. You better get better soon. I missed the end of the concert to be here. Now Eva found herself alone in the room. For XANA this was a perfect opportunity to become better acquainted with his new body. He had to learn how to move and speak. He managed to take control of the eyes. Right, left, up, down. He tested the limits of his vision, looking from the far end of the bed up to the neon light set in the center of the long ceiling, and from the window to the door. Now he had to consider the rest of the body. He concentrated and tried to move a finger. The index of the right hand. Nothing happened. Move, the, finger. You, the finger, move. Please, Fienger. Damn it. The right fist abruptly clenched shut. Anger. That was the trick, don't ask it to happen, just make it happen. Eva opened her mouth. Ee -e was his first word. It was a confused and strangled moan, but it was a start. Next, he wiggled all his fingers and toes. When he managed to raise the bed sheet he realized he was making good progress. He rose to her feet, and ended up face down on the floor. Lashing pain engulfed his body. Stupid, weak humans. Somehow or other he managed to lift himself onto all fours. Then he stood up and tried to walk again, fell down again, but this time his hands were ready to mitigate the blow. Try again. He got back onto his feet. This time he managed two steps before falling. Try again. Half an hour later he had managed to walk the entire length of the room. Approaching the window he opened it, the infirmary was on the third floor and overlooked a relatively quiet road, where an old van was passing by, vomiting black smoke from its exhaust pipe. At the bottom of the road, a woman in pink overalls was jogging along, holding the leash of a small dog in her hand. Eva considered for a moment the prospect of simply jumping down from the window. No, she decided. She couldn't risk breaking a bone. That was unacceptable. There was a gutter pipe attached to the building's wall that came within half a meter of the window. Climbing down did not seem an impossible enterprise. She clambered onto the window sill and took hold of the pipe, which emitted a metal groan. She quickly began to climb down, barefooted and dressed in only a hospital gown, her attention focused on the necessary motions, hand, foot, hand, foot. When she was almost at the bottom, she allowed herself to fall and landed on her back, sprawling out on the asphalt and feeling another flood of pain. Just how fragile was this body? Did you just hurt yourself darling? asked the lady with the dog, rushing in her direction. Her graying hair was tied up in a ponytail and her face was almost hidden behind a large pair of sunglasses. Two wires could be seen emerging from her ears. Are you in pain baby? She removed one of the earphones. Why are you almost naked? You don't even have shoes. Wait here while I call someone. Of course, human beings often changed their garments, and probably Eva's current ensemble was inappropriate. She considered her options. Then she rose to her feet and approached the woman. About ten minutes later Eva walked calmly away, wearing a pair of pink overalls several sizes too big for her, the arms and legs rolled up to prevent her from stumbling. Behind her, on the street corner, the small dog was barking desperately. 14 An Unexpected Journey, City of the Iron Tower, France, January 9th, it seemed that peace had finally returned to the Hemitage's living room. Yumi and Elida were chatting and smiling while Ulrich was sitting quietly on the couch. Every so often he flicked a popcorn kernel towards Kiwi, the scrappy little dog catching them in his mouth. Jeremy picked up the telephone receiver and motioned for silence. He dialed in the number they had been given. Hello, a deep voice answered on the third ring. Hello, good afternoon to you. I'm looking for Mr. Philippe Brulet. Who might you be then? My name is Jeremy. Eh, <clears throat> Jeremy Belpois. I wanted to talk to him regarding something from several years ago. I am, a friend. Alright, I'll pass you on to him. 
Just be aware that he's quite deaf, so you'll need to speak up when you talk to him. The next person Jeremy heard was a man, wheezing tiredly as he spoke slowly into the phone, Hello, who is this? Hello sir, I, eh? I can't hear you. Who did you say you were again? Hello. Good day to you. Oh, that's better. I can hear you now. Carry on. My name is Jeremy Belpois. I'm calling you from the city of the Iron Tower. Ah uh, yes. But there's no need to yell quite that loud, goodness me. Yes I know that city quite well. I lived there for many years with my brothers. My word that was a long time ago. People used to call us the three brulets, my, my. Mr. Philippi seemed to be losing himself in a whirlwind of memories. I was looking for information about a man who toughed at Caddick Academy, by the name of Hopper. Who? Hopper. Ferns Hopper. The old man's tone abruptly changed. Now he sounded hostile. Nothing, I don't know anything. But we believe you worked on his home. The Hermitage, I've never known anyone by that name Brulette repeated. Kindly don't bother me again. And he hung up the phone. Pleasant man commented Jeremy, turning to face his friends. But you know what Mr. Brulette? If you won't speak to us on the phone, then we'll just come speak face to face with you. What do you mean? Where would we be going? Asked Ulrich, his face turning pale. Jeremy gave the name of the small coastal city where Mr. Brulette resided. Then he added, it's currently 5.30. If we take the first train we'll arrive there around 9 o'clock. We can then return on the last train, around midnight, and arrive back here at 3 in the morning. Then we catch 5 hours sleep, and arrive at school tomorrow rested and ready. You've completely lost it this time Einstein, replied Ulrich incredulously. You want us to travel halfway across France because an old man hung up on you. You don't understand, Jeremy responded. He knew something. As soon as he heard the name of Elida's father he ended the conversation. Maybe we should have offered to pay him, suggested Ah. Nobody laughed. If he really did work on the hermitage, he might be able to give us useful information about this house. Yumi was resting on the couch, a drink in her hand. But as you said Jeremy, if he worked on the hermitage. All we know for certain is that his name is on some sacks of cement in the basement. And what you're proposing is a really long journey. If only we could postpone it for a few days. Actually I think it's a fantastic idea, commented Odd. I was beginning to get bored anyway. Eventually Ulrich sighed. In the end Elida should make the decision. After all it's her house we're talking about. The girl in question, who until this point had seemed somewhat distant, rose to her feet. Well, I can tell you what I'm going to do. If Jeremy says this is serious, then I'm going to go and speak to this Mr. Brulette. I know it might be hard for you to understand but, my father is gone. This house, with its secret passages and everything else, is the only connection that still binds him to me. If there is someone who can tell me more about the hermitage and help me remember, then I'm ready to go to the ends of the earth to meet them, and I'm coming with you Jeremy joined in. You'd make a useless knight in shining armor, Odd teased him, landing a friendly punch on his shoulder. If Elida goes, we all go. They arrived at the station a minute before their train departed. Five children heavily wrapped in clothes to protect themselves from the blizzard. Fortunately they did not have to buy tickets, Jeremy had already taken care of that online. Wait for us, yelled Odd to the railroad inspector who, wrapped in a dark coat, was making sure no one was left on the platform. The train's doors closed behind them an instant after Ulrich had shoved Elida up the gangway and jumped on board as well. Wow, what luxury! Odd exclaimed, I've never traveled on a TGV before. Jeremy smiled, you can thank the school's credit card. Wait, what? Well, the tickets were very expensive and I didn't have the money to pay for them, explained Jeremy, hunching his shoulders. So I hacked into Caddick's computers and took the details of the credit card principal Delma's uses for scholastic expenses. Have you gone mad? Elida reproached him. The principal will notice what you've done. No he won't. I filed the payment under the section in, UN Foreseen Expenses, headed, My Daughter Sissy. Ulrich looked severely at him. Jeremy, this is called theft. Come on guys, I only took that money as a loan. And I have every intention of repaying them down to the last euro. Odd laughed scornfully, his fists resting on his hips. Look at our little whiz kid. Always acting so serious, and then we discover that underneath it all he's talented data pirate. Elida was not smiling. 
I'm not happy with this, she commented icily. Okay, perhaps I made a mistake. Jeremy admitted. But no one will notice, and tomorrow I'll make arrangements for my parents to foot the bill, all right. No. We'll each pay our share. They settled into their reserved places, four armchairs separated by a small table, and a fifth seat on the other side of the central corridor. At this late hour the carriage was completely deserted, except for them. The sleek silver high-speed train picked up speed through the city's suburbs, the silence disturbed only by the breathing of the carriage's heating systems. Beyond the windows the city was giving way to a lunar landscape, a mantle of snow draped over everything, trees, fields, the drooping roofs of farmhouses. And the sky was inflamed, dark with the promise of more snow. At least we're traveling south towards the heat, observed Ulrich. And that gives us three hours to relax. The ideal opportunity for a nap, concluded Odd, rolling his heavy jacket into a pillow and stretching out on his seat. The loudspeakers crackled out the name Marseille Saint Charles. Their destination. The terminus was a huge structure with a glass and steel overhead roof. The train rolled in calmly, catching its breath after having run at full speed halfway across France. I checked some notes he had in his pocket. Is the place where we need to go far. Place de Lanche. It's not very far, about two kilometers. The station was at the top of a long and sloping street. High above, on the summit of the opposite hill, they could see the church of Notre Dame de la Garde, the basilica's towering belfry standing alongside a great dome. Bullrich was right, the climate here in Provence was noticeably hotter than in their home city, even if there was a strong and damp wind blowing in off the sea. That way, towards the Pontier, decided Jeremy, consulting a map he had printed off the internet before they had left. It's the most notorious part of the city. Are you serious? asked Todd, alarmed by that revelation. Jeremy laughed no. That is, it used to have a really bad reputation, but nowadays it's a tourist trap. Actually, in summer it must have been a very attractive suburb. Tall and narrow villas with multicolored facades leaned against one another for support, and the lanes were so narrow that one could not walk down them with arms outstretched. But now it was evening, and the streets were dark. The children kept checking over their shoulders, fearful that someone could be following them. Then they had to confront the Monte de Acco Yules, a long flight of stairs driven between the buildings. It is so beautiful. Elida commented in admiration. Yeah, but couldn't they have provided a beautiful escalator for us to ride up on, this sucks. Odd lamented, panting as they climbed towards the top. Oh come on Ulrich teased him. Aren't you supposed to be the one with the agility of a cat? Eventually they reached the end of the climb and descended down the other side, emerging into the place de Lanche, facing towards the Notre Dame de la Garde. The church crowned the summit of an outcrop far higher than the hill they had just laboured over. Between them and it the land fell off into the harbour, which sparkled with reflections of the city's lights. In the distance they could just hear the sound of waves breaking on the shore. That way said Jeremy, indicating a side street. They arrived in front of a tall house. It was painted a faded orange, and had several green, shuttered balconies. Affixed beside the door was a brass plate, Francie OIS and Laurette Brulette. And beneath that, Philippe Brulette. Francois was an impressively large and powerful looking man somewhere in his thirties, with a shaved head that gleamed in the lamplight. What do you want? Jeremy recognized the cavernous voice that he had spoken to that afternoon on the telephone. He summoned his courage and declared, we would like to speak to Mr. Philippe, if he is home. I telephoned earlier today. The man did not say anything, his immense tonnage was now blocking the entire width of the door, and he showed no sign of being willing to invite them in. Please, this is very important to us, Jeremy insisted. We've come a very long way in order to see him. And why should that concern me? Elida was about to intervene, when a female voice called out from behind the man, Who is it, love? Five little kids. And you're not letting them in, right? Ask them if they've had dinner. The man snorted, then looked at the children one by one, peering down from his great height. Have you had dinner, he asked grumpily. No actually, confessed Odd, who was hungry as usual. Then I'll prepare some sandwiches, the thoughtful woman replied from inside. Grudgingly, Francois moved from the door and allowed them to pass. They were made comfortable in a small but cozy dining room. The table was still late and the lingering smell of a delightful roast dinner whetted the children's appetites. When Lorette arrived with the sandwiches, the five young guests literally attacked the tray. 
These are perfect lady, just fantastic, said Odd, who was almost choking on a rasher of ham. The woman smiled indulgently. It's nothing, nothing at all. Then she sat at the table with them, watching while they ate. But tell me, what can you want of us at this hour? Are you alone or is someone accompanying you? Yumi decided it was better to lie, so as not to arouse their suspicion. Yes, our teacher, she said quickly. Today is the last day of our vacation and we wanted to take advantage of it to speak with Mr. Philippe. It's very important. We're hoping that he can help us trace someone. One of Elita's relatives, added Jeremy, indicating towards the friend in question. Please, could you call him for us? There's no need as he's right here, said a voice from behind them. Philippe Brulette was a man of around 60 years old, of the same dimensions as his son but with less muscle tone. His hands were those of a worker, big and calloused. Dad, these kids were looking for you, declared Francois. Those that called earlier today, a wager. Hopper and company. Mr. Philippe sat and rested his elbows on the table. I had the feeling I wouldn't get rid of you easily, he sighed. That's because it's really important Mr. Brulette, please believe us. Philippe scrutinized them at length, stopping when his eyes rested on Elida. I remember that Professor Hopper had a daughter much like you. You could be her twin sister. Even though today she would be, at least twice your age. Actually Elida is the professor's niece, Jeremy quickly intervened. She's the daughter of his, ERM, sister. The others looked at him, tense, but said nothing. When Jeremy got going with one of his inventions, it was difficult to predict where it would end. Yes, that could be it, the man rumbled. Same eyes. Same hair. Francois, get me a beer would you, a bitter perhaps. Why did you hang up on me today, when I mentioned the name Hopper? Jeremy asked abruptly. Because, oh well, it's been long enough, I guess. Philippe took a glass offered by his son, savored a sip of the beer and began to speak. I don't remember the exact year. At the time I was still working with my brothers, up north, on our firm. If I'm honest business wasn't particularly good at the time. But then, one day, we were contacted by a man who wanted us to take on a big job, an important job, to renovate part of a factory, a factory on an island, asked Yumi. Philippe nodded. We were paid well for the work we did, too much even. In exchange, the man required us to maintain absolute secrecy about what we were doing. The government was involved, you understand, or at least that's what he told us. He never revealed his name to me, and the company that was paying into our account didn't exist, I checked with the Chamber of Commerce. Yet the money kept coming, punctual and plentiful, and we were in no condition to refuse it. He sipped at his beer, seemingly staring at a point in the distance. Then he continued, we had to go to the site blindfolded, in some vans with tinted glass windows, like in the movies. And once inside, we were not allowed out of the room that we had been assigned to. None of us ever understood what was being done in that factory, or what we were being paid to set up. I remember there was a lift, and rooms that were being prepared for some, strange pieces of electrical equipment, I think. In any case, there was another pause. The next year, the same man recalled us and introduced us to Furman's Hopper. He was a serious kind of man, but nice enough. And he had this little girl that, damn, it seems to me that her name was Elida as well, the room seemed to turn cold. But Elida quickly intervened. You mean Eloida? My cousin. Eloida, it's possible. Anyway, Hopper had moved into the city to work at a nearby school, a sort of high school, and he wanted us to renovate this little old villa that he'd given a strange name to. The Hermitage. There you go. Bravo. It was the same conditions, take the cash, keep your mouth shut. We finished the work, Hopper was satisfied, and eventually the mysterious man paid us. That's all there was to it. That's all, protested Odd. Mr. Philippe, be honest, Ulrich pressed him, smiling conspiratorially. It wasn't just a simple renovation, correct? We've seen the secret passage that connects the hermitage, to the factory. Philippe shrugged his shoulders, irritated. I promised to never say anything. But this is important. And I made a promise. The government was involved. And if it wasn't government, it was still someone very dangerous. I didn't want any trouble then and I can't imagine myself wanting any now. Elida stood up and approached him. But now my uncle has died. And I've got nothing left to remember him by she said in a weak voice. 
And how do you expect me to help? We thought intruded Jeremy. That is to say, we believed that you could help us learn something else about the professor. Lorette, who like Francois had returned from clearing and washing the plates, smiled. Come on Philippe. Isn't it possible for you to tell them anything? These are just children, what could they do to you? Mr. Brulette sighed, and eventually surrendered. That's as maybe, Lorette, nice reasoning. But in return I'd like another glass of bitter. Then he turned to face the children and resumed speaking, in fact there is one more thing I can tell you without violating my promises. Hopper came after me again some time later, but this time the nameless man was not with him. It must have been about 10 years ago, but I remember it well. Hopper asked a personal favor of me, I had to return to the hermitage and wall up a section of the house, so as to create a hidden room invisible from the outside. I told him it was a pointless job, because someone could easily find it by comparing the house against the plans and elevations in the public records. He answered that he would take responsibility for that problem. He seemed rather frightened. And he offered to pay me, not as well as the other man had, but a more than reasonable amount. So I agreed. He had a secret room built in the hermitage, an incredulous Jeremy replied. Cool whispered odd. But why? What use could it have been to him? Yumi asked, sceptical. Philippe Brulette squeezed his eyes, as if trying to seize hold of a faraway image long faded with time. The last time I saw Fermin's Hopper was in the summer of that year. He'd become very thin, consumed with his work. I always suspected that he was more than the simple school teacher he kept insisting to be. I had just dropped by to collect my payment and to pick up some tools I had left behind. And then he suddenly begged me to leave, as if he was in a great hurry. Before saying goodbye to him however, I posed the exact same question, Professor I asked. Do you mind telling me the purpose of a room that nobody can enter? He smiled mysteriously and replied to protect it. And as such, I've left behind a map that only the right person can find. They all turned, instinctively, to face Elida. And now kids, that really is the end of my story. None of them wished to hang around in the city. Not when they had made such an incredible discovery, there was a secret room in the hermitage. And a map left behind for a specific person. Who most likely was the same person who no longer had any memories of her past life, let alone where a map might be hidden. To the station. Jeremy proposed, as soon as the door of the Brulette residence closed behind them. Ulrich agreed quickly, let's hit the road. They quickly retraced their steps along the deserted streets, almost running. Elida trailed behind the main group by several paces. She wanted to have a little bit of space, and so the others did not disturb her. They reached St. Charles Station at just a few minutes before 11. Keep going. Jeremy exhorted them. If we take the train due to depart now, we'll arrive back at the house at 2 instead of 3, that gives us one more hour to search for the room. The TGV train was already at the platform, standing beneath the illuminated departures slash arrivals board. The locomotives at either end were powered up and over the station loudspeakers a voice was inviting passengers to board. The children sprang forwards, sprinting towards the long metal serpent. They leapt inside, the doors closed with a sonorous ding-dong and the train stirred into motion, taking them back to the house. That's the second time that we've only made it by the skin of our teeth, I judged. Oh Jeremy murmured. We've got a little problem. What? We haven't changed our booking. Our tickets were for the midnight train, not this earlier service. Are you afraid they might make us pay a penalty, asked Ulrich, laughing. No, but we won't have seats reserved for us. Yumi checked inside the carriage, it was deserted. Looks to me like we're the only ones riding this train tonight. Let's just sit down here. If someone arrives we'll just move to another carriage. 15 Eva Skinner So, apparently, we're given... They hear insight to whoever has built the hermitage, as well as then taking possession of even inner. Not a poem, not a poem, not a polymorph specter, but then himself taking refuge inside Eva's inner. Wow. In the face of this more be, be more than a half hour video, 
we have found a whole lot. <laughs> I didn't think that there would be that much going on in this video. But anyway, I've drawn out this video so far long beyond.